Uh, Our scripture reading is also Psalm 2. Um, I'll be reading out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. Uh, I'll begin with the superscript uh, at the top, just prior to verse 1. To the choir master, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor, and with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that makes great boasts, Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified, Seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would, um, in a special way, uh, come into our hearts and, and work these words, this community lament, this psalm, uh, which recognizes the evil in our world, that you would work these words into our heart and the hope it brings, uh, that we may fear our Lord alone, that we may trust him above all things in our circumstance, we pray. Amen. Uh, So in the Psalter, we have 150 psalms. There's of course, different kinds of psalms. There's psalms of thanksgiving. There's royal psalms, psalms that praise the king. And of course, there are psalms of lament. Uh, our psalm today is considered a community lament, uh, lamenting the lies and the words that have created injustice in society, that have really created an unjust society, where the poor are victimized. Uh, and in the context of this original psalm, seems to be in relation to uh, perhaps a political climate, uh, perhaps leaders. Uh, Of course, I think we can identify with uh, governors and leaders uh, in our day and age who use their words for evil. Uh, However, this psalm also speaks um, more generally to the power of words, uh, particularly in our personal relationships. Uh, So as we look at this psalm, I'm just going to look at two points here, really the chaos of unjust words and the orderliness of just words. First, the the chaos of unjust words. Well, what exactly is the problem with a lie? Uh, God is truth. God's laws, we established this when we worked through the Ten Commandments in our evening service. God's laws, they are not just arbitrary. They're not just arbitrary laws that have no purpose. Rather, they reflect to us who God is. Lying is wrong because God is truth. uh, Same reason we shouldn't be unfaithful because God is faithful. We shouldn't lie because God's truth. Uh, James D. Kennedy, who was the uh, minister who uh, developed the evangelism explosion uh, program and was minister of a... um, uh, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida, uh, he wrote this on his book on the Ten Commandments about lying. He says, truth is inherent in God's nature. If God were not true, we would only have chaos. And that's an important truth to remember. A lie brings chaos into the world. It confuses people. It causes them to make decisions based on unreality. Uh, the Hebrew word specifically that's, that's used here in this psalm for lie means worthless. It's an empty word. It's an empty idea. It's, it's worthless. 
Lies, in other words, detract from worthy and rich words. They pollute and destroy what is true, good, and beautiful. Uh, James Johnston wrote, as a church, nothing will destroy our relationships more quickly than lies. Destruct, uh, destruction that leads to division. Uh, so if you remember, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, in Ephesians, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Um, uh, I've been following on a podcast these men who have been in prison for life sentences, and then like 30, 40 years later, they get exonerated based off of new evidence. Uh, and as I was preparing for this message, I read about one, uh, a guy named Glenn Simmons. He was 70 years old, and um, I believe he was just released like the end of last year. 70 years old, he served 48 years in prison. 48 years in prison for the murder of a woman named Carolyn Sue Rogers in Oklahoma. The murder happened in 1974. Uh, he was freed from prison after a district court found out that prosecutors had not turned over crucial evidence to his defense lawyers, including witness testimony that had identified other suspects. Lies have destructive consequences. By the way, that's a common theme I've been following in these prisoners who are exonerated, that the, the, the leaders, the prosecutors, those in government were lying by hiding evidence. Lies inevitably lead to injustice. They destroy all that is true, good, and beautiful, and that's, of course, one of the points here in Psalm 12. It's a psalm of lament, a community lament, the, the, the community lamenting over the effects that the lies had created. Now, this psalm could cover the range of lies uh, from, from those in leadership all the way to those who hurt you by gossiping. Um, for flattering lips, right? that's one of the, the terms listed here. Uh, everyone utters lies to his neighbor, verse 2, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Uh, flattering lips in Hebrew is this word that means like smooth, smooth. Uh, Proverbs 29, 5 says that a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Flattery, uh, I used to teach my students uh, when I taught at a school uh, to be weary of, be leery of, of, of Flattery. Don't let it, you know, woo you. Flattery is so bad because it's a form of dishonesty, really. Even if your words are true, there's an intention there that's not being revealed. They're designed for a purpose. It relegates, what it does is when you're flattering someone, you're relegating them into an object to get what you really want. But we know people are not objects to be manipulated. They're image bearers of God that are to be treated with love and respect and honesty. And that's how flattery is different from, say, just generally complimenting someone or, or encouraging them. Proverbs 26 says that a lying tongue hates its victims and a flattering mouth works ruin. Uh, this third criteria here, uh, a double heart they speak, right? They uh, utter lies to their neighbors with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Uh, a double heart is someone who is, um, you've probably heard this phrase today, a double-minded man, right? And that's, that's really what it means. When we think of the heart in Western culture, uh, we think of emotions. Um, but that's not really the biblical understanding of this metaphor. I had a student from... Uh, South China, and I had a student from North China. It was interesting how different their cultures were. Uh, but when I was talking about the biblical view of the heart, this metaphor, uh, the South Chinese student came up to me after class, and he goes, well, in South China, the heart isn't like your feelings. If you say, make that decision from the heart, you're really telling them to make a decision from like, uh, like a place of thinking. <laughs> right? So it's like the exact opposite in Western culture. But you see, in Hebrew culture, this metaphor for the heart, is not just thinking or rationality, and it's not just emotions. 
the heart is this metaphor for the summary of the person, the, the inner you, who you really are, the real you, the, the steering wheel of your life. So this would be the equivalence of us today saying, oh, well, you know, Joe Smith is a, a John Smith, a, John Doe is a double-minded man, right? To say someone is double-hearted, it's that they don't really live for truth, they live for themselves. And in one circumstance, they can, they can be one way and in a different way in another circumstance. James says in the opening chapter of his book, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Um, I was Many years ago, I was with one of my close friends when he discovered that his sister may, may, it was a rumor, may have had an abortion. And um, I, rem- I was with him right when he found out, and he was furious. Uh, and yet he was, at the same time, he was sorrowful. Uh, telling me that his, he believed his sister had murdered his only nephew or niece. And um, however, I remember months later, he had told me that his girlfriend might be pregnant. And I asked him if he was excited about potentially becoming a father, and he communicated to me that he preferred she had an abortion. Right? In both circumstances, all he cared about was himself. Truth meant nothing to him. And to this day, he is a double-hearted man, a double-minded man. And his life is unstable, uh, still to this day. Uh, So what Psalm's talking about, these these people, because they are liars, they are selfish, they are manipulative, they have left destruction in their path. Scripture in no way underestimates the power of words. James 3 relates the tongue to a rudder, a small rudder steering such a a large ship. Uh, I like that ship they have down at the museum, uh, uh, down off of Washington Street. And they have that ship that they've lifted and and you can walk through. Of course, we did that with our kids a couple times, uh, especially when their grandparents came down from Pennsylvania. Uh, But we got to go under the ship and you can see the rudder that steers such a large ship. And that's the metaphor James uses. And he says the tongue is a fire setting on fire the entire course of life. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Words are words whether they are good or evil, our words have power. Gossip or imprudent words, which are really careless words, words we just utter out often without thinking, they can significantly harm. Uh, In society, these words will go out and cause injustice. We see that with politicians. Uh, Karl Marx said famously, quote, Give me 26 lead soldiers, or excuse me, give me 26 lead soldiers and I'll conquer the world. Give me 26 lead soldiers and I'll conquer the world. He said that referring to the 26 letters of the alphabet. Um, If you've ever read the Communist Manifesto, um, he ends with working men of all countries unite course, calling calling for the revolution, calling for men to become violent with the ruling class. Those six words have resulted in the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. This leads to the orderliness of just words, right? There's the chaos in unjust words and unjust words, but there is an orderliness of just words. The Bible doesn't downplay the power of false or manipulating words, but describes the bleak reality of the community and harm they create. Nonetheless, this psalm offers hope. Uh, In this imprecatory part of the psalm, where I assume it's David writing, uh, David prays, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips. It's kind of a gross image, right? (laughs) Just these lips that are causing destruction, cut them off. And the tongue that makes great boast. Um, The Lord will silence these words. Uh, To cut off the lips that utters these words. In Hebrew, 
this word cut off is the same verb that is used when you cut a covenant. So think of Abraham uh, cutting the animals in half to make a covenant with the Lord. Right? Uh, it's judgment. It carries the concept uh, to cut off, uh, to cease to be, right? Just like those animals ceased to be when Abraham cut them in half. He put their lives to an end. This is David's imprecatory request. Um, this is a figure of speech, the Psalms being poems and being prayers. They utilize mightily uh, figures of speech. Uh, this is what is called a synoptiki, uh, which is when you use the parts to refer to a whole. Uh, so if I say, look at that set of wheels, am I wanting you to look at just wheels? No, I'm wanting you to look at the car, right? That's a synoptiki. Or if I say, uh, like on a ship, all hands on deck. Well, you want more than fingers and hands on a deck. You're calling for the men to come onto the deck. So to cut off these lips, David is using a figure of speech to the Lord. What he's really crying out for is not violence, but just, Lord, put an end to these lies and the destruction and injustice that this is unleashing. Uh, first, God brings orderliness to the chaos through judgment. God brings orderliness through judgment. Uh, when someone hurts you with their words, uh, whether they're false, slanderous, manipulative, or just plain gossipy, God will bring judgment. You will be vindicated. I love that. That's what we saw at uh, the end of Psalm 1 two weeks ago when we looked at or Psalm 11, rather. Uh, and that's one of the themes here in Psalm 12. God will vindicate victims of injustice. When words are weaponized against you, we know the Lord cares. Um, the original context of the ninth commandment dealt with the courtroom testimony right, uh, to, to not bear false witness. But if you remember when we looked at the ninth commandment, which really that's what the ethic of this commandment's getting at, or this psalm is getting at. But the ninth commandment also extended to twisting someone's words, it forbids gossiping or slandering. Uh, gossip is notoriously difficult to define as there are so many gray areas. But gossip, I use this definition, it's passing along hearsay or a rumor that cannot be substantiated. It also includes when we pass along an unnecessarily shared true report. Uh, so gossip can be sharing the truth, but it's just not the truth that you need to know. Um, this damages a person's reputation, which the Ninth Commandment is in part designed to protect. Uh, you can harm someone by sharing information that you have no business sharing. Uh, God will judge this. He promises that he will vindicate victims. Second, the Lord, he cares. Though he cares for those who's victimized. Look at this, uh, verse 5. Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise. This is the Lord speaking. I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him that is a victim, the needy. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. Um, if you go back and look at the Old Testament law in Exodus and Deuteronomy, oppression of the poor is... An immediate, it's a quick way to arouse God into action, which is why we should protect, we should protect those who are particularly vulnerable. Uh, since our words carry power, they can victimize. We must be careful because the Lord promises throughout Scripture that he will protect those who are vulnerable and those who have been victimized. Uh, third, in contrast with the false words, Scripture tells us, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. In ancient cultures, uh, silver underwent this refining uh, process in which it would be refined multiple times, which would, of course, remove the dross. 
the imagery here that is if, if one is purified seven times, well, <laughs> what does seven most often represent in Hebrew scripture? Completion. Completion. Okay, the Lord created the world. Six days rested on the seven. He completed his work. So think of this. The psalm, once again, is using this poetic imagery that his words, God's words, are going to work in us, this purification process, like silver is purified until his words make you complete. There is nothing purer than God's words. It's almost as if David's saying, look, I know these words hurt. They hurt me. But God's word is going to restore us and eventually make these untrue words become undone and will be restored. Uh, I mentioned this story before in a morning service uh, months ago, but uh, right near where Kelsey grew up, uh, there's this Presbyterian church uh, right near her parents' home. Uh, I remember when we first started dating, I would drive her home, and I'd have to go around the bend, around this uh, Presbyterian Church. Uh, it was, it's so old, it was founded 52 years before our nation uh, was founded in this beautiful area by a creek and Amish farmlands, right? You see this, see this church and uh, beautiful mason work and then surrounded it is cows, horses, corn stalks, and tobacco, uh, which the Amish grow. Uh, and I was actually baptized in that church. I became a Christian there. One of the greatest, most well-known traveling preachers visited there, uh, George Whitfield. And um, Gordon told me today at the fellowship meal, he's reading a book about, uh, from John Piper on Whitfield. Uh, but when he showed up to this church, so many people showed up that they couldn't all fit in the sanctuary. And this is like a famous local tale. Uh, so what Whitfield did was he walked out into the cemetery under this gigantic tree and he began preaching God's word right there. Uh, many converts were made, of course, through Whitfield's preaching, but he was also followed by his critics. Uh, he was harassed by this group called the Hellfire Club, a group that would travel and mock him incessantly. And there was, of course, one member of the group. It was a man named Thorpe. Uh, he was mimicking Whitfield one time. And um, if I remember the story right, he like jumped up on a chair and started mimicking Whitfield's words and his mannerisms. And he was like, acting like he was preaching this sermon, uh, but and with like impeccable accuracy. And while he was imitating Whitfield's tone and facial expressions, he was suddenly, he just was stunned, and he stopped. And he stopped mocking Whitfield. He sat down, and he was converted right on the spot. <laughs> right? He was uttering God's words in a worthless way, and those words still pierced his heart. His worthless words were encountered by a word that was so living and active that it could purify even the most smooth, worthless heart. And when we come to God's word, we come prepared to know God and ourselves through communing with the living God. And we're prepared for the Lord to pierce our hearts. We're prepared for his word to purify us, to complete in us, right, the seven times, that which the Lord wants to complete in us, the men and women that he wants us to become. And those, his word will also meet the lies, the flattering words, the double-hearted people of darkness to judge. And I love the ending of this psalm, the last two verses. He says, you, O Lord, will keep them, you will guard us from this generation forever. On every side, right? It's another figure of speech. We're surrounded. On every side, the wicked prowl as the vileness is exalted among the children of man. See, this psalm ends with an acknowledgement of the reality of the godless world in which we live, but also with the hope of God's word to judge the evil we see. May God purify our words and our hearts before he comes. Let me pray. 
Lord, we, in one sense, tremble at the thought of your judgment. Uh, But in another sense, we know that your judgment should be a reassurance to us. uh, That you have come to deal with sin, death, and evil. uh, And that you have sent us your spirit to remove us from the dominion of evil. And that although we still are uh, sinful, uh, that we belong to the dominion of our king, a benevolent dominion, a benevolent kingship of a God who protects us, of a God who will not tolerate the injustice unleashed against us, against those who are victimized, those who are vulnerable. So, Lord, in one sense, we pray for repentance of our neighbors. We pray for our repentance, that we would grow more and more into the image of Christ. But, Lord, we also pray, come quickly to renew this world, to bring down your heavenly Jerusalem, that we can dwell with the living word of Christ forever, we pray. Amen.